So welcome everyone. The last day of Kolesh and today I'm just going to talk about, oh, well, I mean, the title is DBT at the center of pipelines, but the original title was how we bastardized DBT, you know, in the map. So a little bit about the company first, you know, it's kind of mandatory in these days. We are a aerial imaging company. We fly planes, take pictures uh, of what's on of what's on the ground and then stitch them up into maps. And then we serve them, you know, by API. And we also have our own sort of Google map app as well. It's high resolution, high recency. We have like, you know, 2D, 3D layers, AI layers, you know, it's pretty necessary for all tech companies these days. And we serve mostly, mostly, you know, roofing insurance and utilities customers, you know, and we're fast growing company as well. And, uh, you know, that, that fast growing bit actually gives us quite a bit of pain points, I'd say, and I'll go through that later and jumping straight to our uh, data team, you know, a team of two. So it's pretty tiny, you know, for like a 300 people company, more than data stack, you know, we've got five trend DBT looker. And, uh, you know, obviously we do er everything in and out, you know, of the data warehouse, you know, the data sources, we manage them, we manage how they come in, we manage how they get transformed inside data warehouse. And we also manage how they're served as well. And, uh, you know, it's a bit of a sort of messy diagram on the right that you see here. Some sources, you know, coming through via Fivetran into Snowflake, the data warehouse that we use, and it goes to Looker, but it also goes to other places as well. And, you know, just to give you guys a little background. So this is to really start the talk here, you know, uh, very, you know, quickly went through, you know, what the company is and, you know, what the team's like. So this talk, DBT at the center of pipelines is about, is about refuting what Tristan said, you know, I think it's, you know, pretty long ago in 2017, probably things have changed, but in the very early days, you know, Tristan once said, you know, in uh, one of his blog posts that DBT is the T in ELT. It doesn't extract or load data, but that is extremely good at transforming data that's already loaded into your data warehouse. So I guess that was, that was kind of true, you know, at the beginning of our own DBT journey, we started using DBT when I think about like two and a half years ago, or maybe like three years ago and back then you know it was really simple you know we had redshift as our data warehouse we had five trend loading all the data in and dbt was just there you know we slot it in and it does all the transform you know we code you know the uh, business logic you know we do a bit of uh you know dimension dimensional modeling here and there and that's it you know and we serve it you know we we serve the data you know via looker so looker you set up you know, semantic layers, and then, you know, it just reads from our then data warehouse Redshift. So really classic sort of DBT use case there. And it's completely in line with what Tristan said, you know, in the last slide here. But things obviously, you know, got out of hand. And, and we soon had to imagine other ways of using DBT. So what happened? The big thing was that we migrated to Snowflake. And uh, what happened was that we have a fire hose, you know, to, to go a little bit more technical here, we had AWS Firehose landing customer usage data. So whenever they consume, you know, our content, you know, our map content, you know, we, we have a record of, you know, what they consume and, you know, how many, how many megabytes and things like that. So these data, they, these data files, they land in S3. And we had to find a good way to load the data, you know, the customer usage data from, from the S3 buckets, you know, to our data warehouse Snowflake. So there was a problem then because Snowflake, obviously, you know, you could do, you know, you, you can copy data directly from S3 to Snowflake, but it, you know, it doesn't really provide that sort of, you know, scheduling functionality. A lot of Fivetran as well, Fivetran had a, and still, um, has a S3 connector, but then we're talking about like billions of records every day. And, you know, if you know anything about them, you know, that means your bill is going to, going to blow up really, really soon. And also, you know, doing that, you know, we get the scheduling, you know, from five trend causes an issue. 
And then we thought about Airflow. How about, you know, we have Airflow, you know, with some Python job that uses like some sort of, you know, ODBC connector, queries, queries the S-ray buckets and then loads the data into Snowflake. That was, you know, we, we, we're a team of two and back then you know, it was a team of one. So, you know, how, how much do you want to put in your stack, right? You know, it probably looks good in the CV, but you know, it's probably too much burden for the team. So at long last, we came, you know, to this idea, what about, you know, we use DBT and DBT cloud and how do we do it? We're going to go into a little bit deeper in, you know, how DBT does things. So DBT basically, you know, it transforms your data in the data warehouse, but it does so by running SQL that, you know, you've called it obviously to build tables and views and, you know, kind of other objects in your data warehouse. And in the process of doing that, in the process of DBT doing that, it actually runs hooks as well. So what hooks are, are just like uh, SQL statements, SQL commands that, that gets fired off to the data warehouse, either before your model is built or after your model is built. So a very sort of uh, classic use case that you can also find in the official DBT documentation is that, you know, you might want to grant uh, permissions, you know, to read a certain model or you, you want to revoke grant, I suppose, you know, to a certain model that you have in your DBT project and actually run all sort of things there. You know, you can do select one, you know, if you want, and it does nothing at all. You know, it just a SQL statement that does, you know, what SQL call, you know, do, you know, in a data warehouse. So equipped with this piece of knowledge, we thought, why don't we just create dummy models, you know, models that, you know, that says just select null as nothing. And then we would, we would run a pre-hook there, meaning that we tell DBT to run a SQL command before the model gets built. And what it, what that command does is that it would go and load, say, the, 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 the last two days of usage data from S3. So with pre-hooks and with post-hooks, you know, DBT can actually do a lot more than just transforming data as, you know, we talked about just now. And we managed to use that to load the data from S3. And guess what? You know, we discussed how we use pre-hook to load data from S3. What about the dummy model itself? You know, does it materialize as its own view or table? We actually have a post hook, you know, to, you know, basically self-destroy them as well. So the pre-hook loads the data and then the model itself, it just returns a table with no roles. And then you have a post hook that says, just, just drop that table. So it becomes sort of like its own entity where, you know, it just does more than just, you know, the, the data transformation that we see so often in DBT. And soon after that, you know, we found that loading data is not enough as well, really, because, you know, the data, the company grew really quickly and maybe some of you will, will, will have experienced that as well. You know, your other teams, they, they just start like signing up for third party platforms because they don't, they don't want to hire people, you know, they want to just, just pay the money, get someone else to do the job. And we did so as well. You know, we signed up for in-app notifications. So, you know, those tutorial pop-ups or just to say hi, or, you know, you even say that your bill is overdue. We also have marketing automation. So we use Marketo. It obviously has a lot of integration to various places, but we need to su uh, supply data to Marketo as well. And also some other customer management platforms that our, our customer success managers want to use. So what it means is that everyone wants data from the data warehouse, which was good because we've got to a point where the data was reliable. We're happy about that and people acknowledge that. But then we had a problem. How do we serve the data? Because you know, when I introduced my team, I said that our stack initially, you know, at the beginning was really simple. We load data from Fivetran, we transform it with DBT, and we just serve it through Looker. But obviously Looker is not going to do the job, you know, to pump these like data sets into third party apps via their own APIs. You know, we thought about buying a middleware, so something like Zapier or something like that, that costs money. Obviously the smart of you guys would 
would have thought of just like just sign up for a cdp right you know something like segments or you know even census we'll talk about them later you know something like that so that we have like a central a centralized repository of customer data that is ready to be fed to these like third-party apps but all of them cost money and to be honest at the time there was not much of an appetite in the company to invest in these things so being the data engineering team being data engineering team we just started hacking things so introducing aws and lambda for those who have experience with aws you guys probably will be quite familiar with this but for those who who don't in aws they have this service called lambda which is serverless which means this, you don't own the server the service somewhere else aws lambda basically just takes like a script from you be it python node.js whatever and it will just run the code for you it takes care of everything else you don't have to worry about you know how much memory you give you know whether you know all the devops things that you have to do with spinning up some sort of virtual machine or ec2 or something like that and yeah it just simple as that you know it takes a piece of code from you and then it just runs it for you and then you can also set up triggers such as i want you to run this code when um, you see new files you know being written into this s3 bucket something like that so we actually had you know previous experience with you know lambda before and that's why that made it a lot easier for us to use lambda to send data from data warehouse to those third party apps and and that's what we did you know the challenge there was that the third party apps they use uh, they have their own api endpoints and via the api endpoints you can you can just send them customer data or you know like user data something like that and we just needed to bridge our data in snowflake and that api endpoint and what we did was that we would tell snowflake or, or you know var dbt obviously to land the land some data into s3 again using a post hook so some models get run in in dbt and when the model is is refreshed dbt will then run this sql command that says i want to unload this table from snowflake into an s3 bucket and then you know obviously there would there's some pre pre-configured lambda job that would then pick up the new data in the s3 bucket and that's you know and the lambda job would then send the data to the apis and that's done you know we successfully bridge you know what's in data warehouse and you know what the uh, third party apps want the good thing about this is that you know everything here we can actually do it with dbt cloud so you know we end up having like jobs that say run you know two or three times a day and it would go from the very source data, we refresh, you know, some usage data, and then we do a bunch of transform in dbt, and then and then dbt would output, you know, the final model in a deck, and also unload them into S3, which triggers, you know, the whole process of uh, sending, you know, the data to the third party app. So we've talked about unloading data and also loading data and putting them together what i'm trying to show you guys is that dbt actually can do a lot more than just transform you know like tristan said it's with a little bit of help with the pre-hooks with a little bit of help you know from aws lambda you can actually do so much more you know you can actually build a whole pipeline which loads your data from the source and then do whatever transform you want and then also take action on the data as well and that 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 is really valuable because you know in dbt you can actually put them in the same deck in the same pipeline and what you end up doing is that you know you just run one command and then the whole pipeline runs you can schedule it in dbt cloud and it just makes things so much easier so Another example that I have here, this, this sort of full pipeline arrangement is the AWS CloudTrail data. CloudTrail, basically, it's a service from AWS that, that collects, you know, all the configuration changes in AWS. So basically, cybersecurity stuff. 
you know, who who opened what if I was to public internet, something like that. And we actually have DB have DBT to load the JSON data from S3 to 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 the data warehouse via the use of a dummy model and a pre-hook, like we said. And then DBT obviously, you know, does a transform. So JSON data comes in, we need to flatten them, you know, we need to strip out the useful bits and you know make a new model out of it. So that's also done by DBT. And then DBT also then triggers a Lambda function, you know, and that Lambda function will send notification to Slack, you know. So basically what you see on the right here, you know, it's Slack message. And all that is just governed, you know, by one single line of command, you know, DBT run dash, and then, you know, we want to run everything upstream and downstream of one single model. And that, that to me is really powerful. And by the way, you know, if you guys are interested in, you know, how, how this Slack message is made, I'll post this link into um, Slack later, but yeah, going back, going back on uh, to what we're on about, we, by using pre hooks, by using Lambda jobs, we're able to just have the whole pipeline schedule like nicely in DBT cloud and it just worked. So we'll talk about, you know, how we sort of bastardize DBT a little bit, you know, to make it do more than transform, you know, gave you guys some examples, but was it, was it worth it? You know, I mentioned that, you know, we're a small team and we did it this way because, you know, we, 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 no one wanted to pay the money, you know, to do things properly kind of. And I also mentioned that, you know, this is a little bit of a hack really, you know, as a, as a, as a data engineer. So was the whole exercise worth it? Could it, you know, could it be something better? You know, will we still do it? You know, uh, will we, will we do it? Will we keep doing it in the future? So there's a bit of reflection here. Is it good? It's good because it works, right? You know, we've been using it, you know, for multiple third party applications. You know, we just send the data to the APIs like that. You know, we obviously, you know, our Snowflake data warehouse is still, you know, having this scheduled DBT jobs to, to ingest data from our S3 buckets. It works. It's cheap as well. Lambda, you know, you're not, you're not really going to run it like millions times, you know, a day. So, you know, most of the time, in most cases, it will probably cost you nothing, like literally nothing. You know? And then everything is in code as well. Not sure whether uh, you guys like that, but you know, the hooks in DBT, how we unload the data, how we send the data, you know, from, you know, uh, from data warehouse to the um, API endpoints using Lambda, they are all, they are all in repositories where they are like, you know, strong CDCI processes, they are, you know, peer, their code reviews, things like that. And there's flexibility as well, you know, because we get to code what we want to do, we can basically do whatever we want. Sometimes, you know, when we sign up for, you know, say segments or sensors, you know, they might not cover all the things that you want, all the third party apps that, you know, your, your colleagues have signed up for, but if you can provide your custom code, you know, to send your data from data warehouse to uh, third party apps, you can, you can send to whoever, right? But how about the bad things? There's obviously, you know, with with this much of code, there is a lot more work, you know, for your analytics engineers. And sometimes, you know, sometimes engineers, analytics engineers, you know, they come from sort of analyst backgrounds, you know, not really, you know, they might not have a strong sort of, you know, developer background. That could be a bit challenging. And also monitoring, you know, we use Datadog, you know, to, to pick up, you know, Lambda failures, but you know, it's not like when you sign up for segment, you sign up for census, that you have a, this nice dashboard that just tells you, you know, it failed and, you know, why it failed, when it failed. It's a little bit convoluted, you know, how we how we go about monitoring, you know, this kind of pipeline. And there are limitations as well, you know. your Our data warehouse, you know, we, we, we want to ingest data from S3, but we do them as sort of batch jobs, you know, run by DBT. But what if people want real-time data? You know, what if our, you know, we want to use it for more operational 
purposes and you know for for anomaly detection something like that we can't do that so there's a limitation on you know the the batch nature of dbt and uh, the last thing you know er everything is in code so you know I, I i sort of discussed that you know just now you know it's code is good and bad you know it is good because it allows you to do whatever you want to do more or less but there's also more to manage and you know it's also you know i guess you know to a lot of people it's nicer to just have this like you know nice ui where you just perform a few clicks and then you can set up a new connector like five trend right so finally is this for you we've done it this way we're in nemap we have you know sort of successfully bastardized dbt to do all these things that it's not supposed to do but should you do it? I guess the first question is, you know, do you want to be more engineer or more analyst? Are you more interested in, you know, playing with pipelines or are you more interested in, you know, just delivering that, you know, final analysis, you know, to your stakeholders, to your business users, right? If you're more engineer oriented, you know, you know, you're probably interested in, you know, doing something like this, but you know, if you're not, then to be honest, I think it's quite a bit of work to cover, you know, to, to de deliver this sort of DBT pipelines and how rich is your company? You know, say you say maybe your company just got like a series A, series B, and you guys are ready to spend that. Don't think about what we just did, you know, go with a proper platform, you know, sign up with, you know, sensors. If you, if you, if you want to use your data warehouse as as uh, as a CDP, or if you want like a CDP, you know, go with segment, right? And what's your SLA? You know, do people want real time data? You know, we talked about it just now. The the if you want real time data, DBT is not really it. You know, you might be better off going for you know if you're on Snowflake, you want Snowpipe. You know, if you're on Redshift, you know, you want to use Firehose, something like that. And does your third party app have good integration? with other platforms so you know say your colleagues you know they go for a bigger vendor and these bigger vendors usually have direct integration with you know say Redshift or snowflake you know then you might not even need all these things anymore you know you don't need the lambda job you know you don't need you know those post hooks and pre hooks you know everything is done on on the application side so you don't need to do anything and how much code are you willing to manage? You know, again, that, that sort of, you know, brings us back to the first point, right? You know, how technical do you want to go? You know, there are different things that can help you manage your code. You know, you have DBT managing the SQL bit, you have Terraform managing, you know, the, the Lambda bit, or, you know, if you're on G, GCP, you know, they have cloud functions as well. So you have these tools to help you manage the, de the deployment, you know, the maintenance of, of of these components but how far do you want to go you know on this journey and at last you know what data warehouse are you on you know if you're on a postgres that is sort of standalone and it doesn't talk to you know any sort of aws services you know it, it, it's it's a it's an on-prem data warehouse that you have then you know forget about what i just say you know in the last 20 minutes right so so that's basically it. We talked about how we how we brought DBT, you know, from just doing transform to something more on both ends, loading data, unloading data. What's good about it, and why should you, or why shouldn't you, uh, do it this way? So I'm looking forward to seeing your questions in Slack, and I'll see you guys there.